So you're trying to build a business alongside a full-time job. You've got a side hustle. Or you've got a family, like Keith Hunt did in one of the early episodes. He had seven kids and he was trying to build a business. Uh, We had Adam, who's running a side hustle. We had Jamie, who's got a full-time job and she's trying to launch her business as an artist in a Kickstarter package. We're all trying to build businesses and get things done. The question is, how do you make sure you get the most out of your day and make the most of your business? The extraordinary belongs to those that create it. Rebelling against business plans and debt, rebelling against what society expects of us to build cool businesses, make money, have fun and do good. Let's create something extraordinary together. Welcome to The Rebel Entrepreneur. Welcome to The Rebel Entrepreneur. And today we've got Dave Crenshaw. Dave, welcome to the show. Thank you, Alan. So excited to be here. Yeah, I've been looking forward to having you on the show because, well, the title of your most successful book, which that's a statement on its own, your most successful book, is The Myth of Multitasking and How Doing It All Gets Nothing Done. Well, let's just start there. In a world where people are try- have huge to-do lists, they're trying to manage family, business, work, launching a side hustle, like surely we have a huge amount to do. We should be multitasking and doing stuff. Well, that's the feeling that a lot of people have, and it is certainly tempting to do it. But the interesting thing is, the more you try to do multiple things at the same time, the less productive you become. You know, there are three immediate effects of when you attempt to multitask. And in fact, in the book, I call it switch tasking, not multitasking. And switch tasking (laughs) is when you're trying to perform multiple attention requiring tasks at the same time, like you're listening to one of your children while you're checking your email. And what you're really doing is switching (laughs) back and forth, right? That's not an ideal parenting habit. (laughs) Uh, Yeah, I'm sure no one (laughs) listening to this has ever done that. But when you do that, things take longer. So you actually get less done. You make more mistakes. So now you're having to go and backtrack and correct your errors and your stress levels increase. So there are at least three good reasons, and at some point I'll I'll talk about the fourth, but three good reasons why we actually want to avoid multitasking. And if you can single task, you're going to get far more done. And I love that. And in the particular example you're using, there is an actual downside to both if your emails are from your customers and you've got your son or your daughter with you, there's a downside on both sides because neither of them are getting the attention they deserve. Right. Yeah. And you just described the plight of the entrepreneur. That's actually my my background uh, was starting with entrepreneurs, was working with them. I was acting as a, a business coach. And what I found was that the number two issue that they had, the number two thing they wanted to solve was more time. The first one is more sales, right? Everybody <laughs> listening to us, they want more sales. The number two is how can I get more time? How can I stay on top of all this? How can I do everything that's expected me to do? How can I manage not just five job descriptions, but 25 job descriptions? And I ran into an issue, Alan, where we would have a meeting and I would give them all sorts of interesting things to do with their marketing, with their sales, whatever it was. And they'd say, yes, this is great. I'm going to do it. Amen. They would leave. And two weeks later, they'd come back. And what do you think they would say? Everyone listening to this knows the answer, right? They say, <laughs> or they oh. rushed the homework just before the meeting. Like I'll spend fifteen minutes doing it. Yeah. yeah. If, <laughs> if I was lucky, what really it was most often like oh, I just didn't get time. I didn't get to it. This mm-hmm. came up. That came up. And I realized that this was the definition of insanity incarnate. So part of where my genesis as a productivity expert came from was helping business owners and entrepreneurs solve this consistent problem. And so I created a training program to help with that. And that's where everything else came from. In fact, the myth of multitasking itself, the book is sort of a mashup of the stories of 10 to 20 different entrepreneurs that I coached on time management through the years. I love that. What a brilliant way to build a program. So let's start straight in on that. What are your thoughts about work-life balance? (laughs) Well, I believe that it is absolutely essential, not just for our well-being, but for our success. 
that we need to make sure that we're devoting a significant amount of our time to things other than work. That actually will help us perform better. It will help us be more creative. Now, a couple of things, though, about the word balance. The first thing is I prefer the term rhythm, meaning that you find your work-life rhythm. And, uh, you know, I, part of my backstory is I tried to be a, a rock star for a few years. So I'm, I'm very familiar with music and rhythm and all that stuff. And every individual has a different rhythm that works for them. Where people get into trouble is where they break that rhythm, so to speak, where they get out of sync with their life. So I don't view work-life balance as like a, an equal equation, but rather determining what is right for you, what is right for your family, and then making sure that you've allocated a consistent amount of time in your week and that you have a consistent schedule where you step away from work and you focus on that. And then you step away from family and you focus on work, that sort of thing. Well, it's interesting when you say when you step away from work, because this is the one of the actual challenges I found, Dave, oh, yeah. when I was launching my business. I remember one particular incident. Uh, it's a Saturday. My wife and I have gone out shopping. My wife's called Katie. We've gone out shopping. She's trying something on. I'm doing the sat in the chair outside waiting thing. And uh, I picked up my phone. And can you guess what I did? Well, I'm sure you you did work. You checked your email. I looked at work emails. Yeah. Yeah. I looked at work emails. I read one that I didn't agree with the customer. Let's put it like that. I didn't <laughs> like the email I got. And my wife came out. And I wasn't with her for the next two hours, but I'd actually read that email on a Saturday when I couldn't do anything about it, when they weren't going to respond. And it meant that I was neither working nor being with my wife. And I think that's that's a huge problem with this stuff. Yeah, I think that example sums up the issue perfectly. What happens is you fall into chaos. A big part of my message is the difference between focus and chaos. And entrepreneurs, business owners, startups, they live perpetually in a state of chaos. Chaos <laughs> is when you allocate your resources, your time, your money, your energy haphazardly. And you allocate those resources to things that have variable value. So what does that mean? It means that chaos is not a, a state of not having success. It's a state of having occasional success. And sometimes things work and sometimes things don't. And that, that randomness of entrepreneurship can become addicting. And what instead we want to move to is focus, which is the allocation of your time and resources strategically to things of greatest value. So it's the same concept. You're still working hard. You're still spending time, but you're only doing it on things that are worth the most. And often all it takes is sitting down and taking a close look at what matters most in this moment. In the, your example, what mattered most was spending time with your wife. And we have to become strategic. Otherwise, we think we're succeeding because we have some success when, in fact, we're just living in perpetual chaos. Well, you can't do it all. That's the problem. There's so many things to do. You cannot do it all. So let's get really practical, Dave. How do I go? Because I, kn I know what I was asking when I really started, and I know what the audience will be asking. Let's get really practical. How do I go from chaos to focus? Because I feel like I have a million things to do. How do I do this? The principle sounds lovely, but give me the how. Sure. And what I'll say is I'm going to talk in sort of a simplified term with this. If you want some detailed exercises and some walkthroughs, the book, The Myth of Multitasking, contains those inside and will help you do the very things that, you know, if someone's consulting, hired me to consult them, I'll charge them thousands per hour to do. So again, I'll, I'll speak in generals, but if you want specifics, get the book, go through those exercises there. So one of the first things is to start to account for how you're using time. I'm not necessarily a big believer in tracking every single minute to get to that. I don't think that that's necessary. And especially for entrepreneurs, I think that's excessive. But what we can do is we can sit down for 30 minutes or so and list out all the different job responsibilities that you have. I'm not talking about listing out like the emails and, and phone calls and stuff like that. I'm talking about listing out marketing and sales and new product ideas, you know, all sorts of different things that you're doing, list them all out, and then 
say, how many hours per week am I spending in each of these things? And just come up with a rough estimate. And then after you do that, take a look at how many hours you think you spend sleeping each week and how much time you spend (laughs) with family each week. And you start to get a really clear picture. Now, here's the funny thing about this. Those numbers, when you're all done with it, have to add up to 168. It has to be 168 hours. And when I do this with entrepreneurs, without fail, it's going to come in over budget. In fact, one client, and her story is in this book, she accounted for 190 hours worth of work. And when we did that, what she realized, she was going home and she was doing research for business and she thought that she was spending time with her family. So she double counted it. She counted time spent with her children (laughs) and time spent doing research. But what it turned out was sort of like the example you gave, she was really just doing stock research in the presence of her family. And when you start to look at the cold numbers like that, That's a good eye opener to help you realize, all right, I have to live within this budget. What is reality for me? That sounds great. So we've decided we've got all these different roles. We've got to sell the thing. We've got to market the thing. We've got to deliver the product. We've got the roles. How do I move from the chaos of all this stuff that I flit between each day and get to focus? Because it sounds like the holy grail of this is focus. Yes, so I think starting with that truth, one, one phrase that I like to use is talking about behavior won't change behavior as quick as helping people understand the truth of their situation. I can talk to you till I'm blue in the face about how you need to be more focused and all this stuff. But until you see for yourself what it's costing you, you're not going to be motivated to make much change. So I like starting with that place of understanding the reality of your situation. Now you have more motivation to say, okay, what changes will I make? Then we can start saying, all right, let's look at your schedule and let's create a budget. How many hours per week are you going to spend building your business? And which hours of the week are going to be most suitable for you to stay focused for a long period of time? Everybody, again, let's go back to that word rhythm. Everybody has a different rhythm to their business. Everyone has a different rhythm to their life, even their physiology. And so knowing what you know about yourself, are you going to be more focused at 7 a.m. in the morning? Or are you going to be focused more focused at 7 p.m. in the morning? When are interruptions least likely to occur? And I'm going to assume that everyone listening to this, uh, building your business is your most valuable activity. That's a concept I talk in all my time management training. Your MVA, what is your most valuable activity? And you want to schedule your most valuable activity during your most valuable time, the time when you're going to be most productive. So that's a good starting place, especially for someone who's just starting their business. So I love this. I love the concept of the most valuable activity and the most valuable time. How do I know what the most valuable activity is? Yeah, it's really simple. I love simplifying things. And it's as simple <laughs> as, so I mentioned that list, right? You've got sales, you've got marketing, we got all these different things that you're doing. What is the value per hour of those things? Specifically, how much would it cost you to hire someone else to do that thing on your behalf and do it as well as you do. For example, at the beginning of this, as we were discussing the podcast, you were talking about your excellent editor, Andrew, right? You could edit these podcasts yourself, Alan, right? Yes, I have. Like, I could learn it. I don't okay. have the desire. That sounds bad, but I don't have the desire to learn it. But yeah, I, I've got the capability. Yeah, that's a smart perspective. Yet I think a lot of entrepreneurs that I've met have the capability of doing everything and therefore they do everything. But that's not how you build a business. You want to look at the stuff and say, what is the lowest value and what can I do to get that off my plate? Can I do it cheaply? Can I even just do it with technology? Can I use a tool that's not too expensive that will simplify the process or reduce how much time I'm spending in it? So you list out all the different activities. And when you do that, you start ranking them based on their value per hour. If you're a true entrepreneur and you're really devoted to your business, there are going to be one or two things 
that rise to the top that if you tried to hire someone else to do on your behalf, it would cost you hundreds of dollars per hour. I'm talking about things like ideation or building systems or selling to your top customers. Those things would be incredibly costly to replace. Therefore, they are your most valuable activities. And that's what you want to be spending your time doing, not all the other junk. But when I talk to the typical entrepreneur, they are spending less than like 25% of their time in their MBAs. That means they're spending 75% or more of their time doing things that are worth less. <laughs> I'm saying that carefully, not worthless, but worth less. And when you do that, you are naturally lowering the value of your business every time you work. So Dave, let's just come back a step. The thought that's going through my head, see a lot of our podcast is about getting going, launching the business, starting it, growing it, all of that sort of stuff, but it's very early stages. How do you balance this approach with at the start you do need to do everything yourself because you haven't yet earned the money to be able to afford anyone to do it for you. Yeah, because I did not want to spend money I didn't have hiring a social media manager that did a few posts for me and didn't bring any money in. Yeah, how do you balance that? Well, you bring up a great point. And especially in the early stages, there is no greater activity than sales because sales brings in money and money is the lifeblood of a business. You just made my day. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So that is your most valuable activity. And that means that you want to be spending the majority of your time selling and you want to do it during the time when sales are most likely to occur, whatever that is for your business, your industry. I don't fully accept the concept, though, that I cannot hire someone else to do something for me. And the simplest example of that is not everyone listening to this makes a hamburger for themselves every time they want to eat a hamburger. That is not a good allocation of time. I can outsource the creation of a hamburger, right? And we've been doing it for years because it's more efficient, it's more productive to buy something from Wendy's for a couple of bucks or whatever it is. You know? <laughs> so we outsource all the time. I can hire an Uber driver. I can hire someone on Fiverr to edit my document. There are numerous things that we all do every day that don't cost a lot that if I spent five bucks having someone else do this for me, I could go make 50 bucks during that hour. So there may be a slight philosophical disconnect here, and I'm okay with that. But I have built my career simply by looking at things and saying, what is the true value of my time? And anything that's worth about a third of that or less, I probably shouldn't be doing. So in other words, if I know I can make $100 doing something else, I need to look at it and say, how could I spend $30 to give myself another hour to go make that? That does take some practicality, some honesty with oneself, because it's really easy to get into the trap of saying, you know what, I would be making so much more money if I wasn't doing this. But if you're not actually selling, if you're not actually making the money, that's a delusion. <laughs> but, <laughs> but if you actually are making that money, then going and doing these other things isn't valuable. And we don't even have to hire someone. You can just use better technology tool. You can upgrade the computer that you're using. You can, you know, right in my hand right here, I have a gaming mouse at my desk. And that has lots of different buttons that I've assigned to macros that save me time so that I can spend a little less time writing emails simply by not having to type out the myth of multitasking every time I need to write the title <laughs> of my book. You would not believe how much time I've spent typing pop-up business school in yes. my world. And you don't have to do that. You could use an app like Phrase Express. There are lots of macros out there where you could just do, you know, P-U-B and then hit a, a, a key and it will type out the whole thing. These are the little things that add up. Yeah, they do add up quite quickly as well. They really do add up quite quickly. So I've got to focus on my most valuable activity, my MVA, and I want to schedule that in my most valuable time. So yes. let's say I'm at my peak at 9am and my most valuable activity as I'm starting my business is sales. I sit down at 9am. I know I have to sell. How do I 
get myself to follow through and make sure it happens. Because I've done these plans before, Dave, and I haven't yeah. always followed through. Well, now we're getting to some really nuts and bolts practical stuff. The first thing I would say is focus is something that you can both protect and grow, meaning it's like playing offense and defense, right? I can score points, I can make it stronger, or I can protect it. And right now as an entrepreneur, I think most of your emphasis should be on protect because there are so many different things that can compete with it. So in that case, you want to implement uh, things that I, I call them switch busters. They're things that can reduce the switches in attention. For instance, I can establish a schedule with, let's say I'm working from home, which a lot of people are doing now. I can establish a schedule with my family and says from nine to 11, I need to not be interrupted. I'll make myself available at 11 to give you focus or for daddy to answer your questions or whatever it is. You make that time available and you teach and train the people around you which time of the day you're not to be interrupted. And then you respect the time that you give them when you will spend time with them. And this is, I'm speaking from practical experience as a, you know, a father of three. I've been working from home pretty much my entire career. And <laughs> my kids, even when they were toddlers, learned to respect dad's time when the office was closed. But the reason why they respected it is because they knew that I would respect the time when they would knock on my door at five o'clock mm. or you know four or whatever it is. And I would turn it off. I'd turn off the email and give my family attention. So it's an agreement that you have to first make with yourself and then you make it with others if they're impacted by that agreement. That's one place to start. I love that. So what are the biggest switch busters? What are the things that distract entrepreneurs that take focus away? <laughs> I can tell you mine. But what do you think are the biggest things that stop people focusing and they end up multitasking because they switch between things so yeah. quickly? What are those switch busters? Yeah, the easiest place is to take a look at technology and the notifications that you're getting. For instance, yeah, <laughs> the emails popping up. Even a wonderful message like, you know, a new podcast has just arrived from Alan. As great as that is, that's going to get in the way of your... No, Dave, don't say it. <laughs> don't say it. Don't tell them to turn that off. <laughs> but I'm going to tell them what they can do instead. <laughs> instead, they have a schedule of when they're going to do it. So they say, I'm going to at uh, 6.30 every morning, I'm going to turn it on. I'm going to listen to Alan. But that's much more powerful than having some app notify you. Or I'm going to have a time. Here's something much more practical. I'm going to have a time when I check my email. I'm going to check my email at 10 a.m. and at 2 p.m. or whatever it is. And you schedule that into your day. And then that frees you from that feeling that so many of us have of having to constantly hit send and receive on our email or even worse, set it up on our phone that it notifies us every single time an email or a text message comes in. You know, a, a study by Rescue Time, which is an app that, that can help you with focus, by the way, they found that the average number of minutes that a worker can take between checking email and instant messages is six. Six. That's 10 times per hour. And then when you factor in what I, what I talk about in my book of, of switching cost, which is means you're paying a cost greater than just the time to do that thing, recovery time, right? Your attention. People are only getting about 20 minutes of actual work done every hour. That's amazing to me. And it explains why so many of us, we end our day and we feel like I've been working really hard. I've been doing all sorts of stuff. I've been hustling. I've been making it happen. And then like your spouse turns to you and said, well, what did you do today? And you... <laughs> it's just like this long. Well, I, I was working hard. I was doing something. Okay. What did you do? Well, let's see. I answered some email and, and then you're dropping off a cliff, right? That is the problem with multitasking personified. We have to reduce these interruptions. And rather than email checking us, we check email on our own schedule. I love that. Because one of the things I automatically turn off immediately I get a new laptop is the email notifications that ping up. I hate the notifications on my computer because they distract me. They make me look at other things and I know how much time I lose. The one that I struggle with at the moment, Dave, is WhatsApp. Mm. I've got my phone next to me. If it is face up, it flashes at me. I've got it on silent. I've got it like all the stuff turned off, but it lights up when the thing comes in and gets my attention. And 
I have to remember to turn my phone face down. And I think, yeah, turning your phone face down, turning off the email notifications, closing Facebook. You know, sometimes I log on to Facebook to do a business post and I do the business post, but I don't close the tab. Yeah. Then I go back to email, flick back to Internet Explorer when I look to something and there's, oh, there's Facebook. And before I know it, six minutes later, I'm like, oh, what was I doing? Yeah. (laughs) And I have to go back to the email to find it. There's a psychological term for this. It's called variable reward ratio or, or variable reward schedule. It's the same thing as compulsive gambling. It's the reason why someone sits at the slot machine in Vegas and keeps throwing quarters in, hoping that something's going to pay off. It's because our brains are hardwired to enjoy what is random. We like the feeling that somehow it might pay off. By the way, doesn't that just sound like the definition of chaos I gave you, right? I'm going to keep pushing the button. I'm going to keep checking send and receive because who knows, maybe a new customer is going to come in. Maybe someone's going to like that post that I gave and we get that little hit of dopamine. And so it forces us to keep doing it over and over. But that perpetuates switch tasking and it is not focus and we end up with haphazard results. So we have to free ourselves from that and get strategic and say, here is one. I'm going to check it. Look, a lot of small businesses really need social media. My business depends on LinkedIn because my courses on LinkedIn learning, my relationship with LinkedIn, we do a lot on that. But I have to do it on a schedule. I have to do it wisely and even limit how much time I do it or I'll get sucked down that rabbit hole perpetually. So Just run me through the LinkedIn bit. So you've got your actual course on LinkedIn learning, and that's where people buy the course. And then you use LinkedIn's social media side to drive traffic or drive people towards the course. And that's how you sort of build your business at the moment. Yeah, well, and the principle here is you want to be where your customers are. In my case, my customers are professionals. They are Fortune 500 companies, which is ironic considering I started with entrepreneurs, right? I I hate red tape and yet I'm in a world of it. (laughs) Uh, So that's where my customers are. And also because LinkedIn learning is my partner for all my courses, I now have, uh, gosh, the 35th course just went up there. And so because they're such amazing partners, I support them. I drive traffic to the courses. uh, I want everyone to know about it. So yeah, that's a part of my schedule. And I deal with that two ways. I deal with it as I just said, with having a schedule. And I also deal with it, as I said, by having someone else manage that for me. Now, I understand you're, you're teaching people to do things without debt. And granted, a social media manager, they're usually very expensive. My person is full-time. So I don't think that's practical for everyone. But what is practical is scheduling 20 minutes at the beginning of the day, 20 minutes at the end of the day, that sort of thing. Or scheduling a, a calendar for yourself where you're going to create content for it on Monday, all afternoon, and then you're going to pre-schedule it to drop on Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, something like that. And then you schedule in the replying to the posts and the engaging with the actual people, which is the bit that actually needs you. Well, yes. (laughs) Even that can be (laughs) trained. Um, You know, my executive assistant, who's amazing, we've spent months training her on how Dave talks. We, we even have a document called the Dave voice. So she's learned that here's how I respond to things in general. Here are the words that I do use. Here's the words that I don't use. But more importantly, here are the things that I don't want her to respond to. Right? There's a situation where I want her to pass it by me first and have my hand in it. And I like that example. The reason I'm sharing that example is to kind of give people a long-term perspective. This isn't short-term if you're starting your business. But understand that a business that is 100% dependent upon you to run is not a business at all. You've just given yourself a job. So you want to start gradually building systems into the business that you're creating. And those systems themselves will help you avoid the myth of multitasking because they'll gradually reduce the workload that you have over time. So I love this, Dave. Let's crack in on this point because I think this is really important. You've got the startup phase. 
and we actually call it maybe running your first mini experiment where you don't know oh, if your business that. is going to work. So you put an offer out to the world, you run the mini experiment, you see if anyone buys it, you do the business and then you do a review and go, did it work? Did I make money? Did I have fun? Did the customer like it? I'm over here with thumbs if up yes, in the proceed. air, by the way. I love that, that yeah. approach. <laughs> Boom. Uh, if no, then try a different experiment. But after you've experimented and you've made some money, that's when you start to turn it into a business. So from your experience, when do you go from bootstrapping, testing, to starting to develop systems? And I guess the reason for asking this is I've met so many entrepreneurs that try and set up all the systems before they even try and sell something to yeah, start no, with. And my method is sell something and then set the systems up later. But there is still the question of when. Yeah. The, the answer is you first must create a glorious mess. <laughs> <laughs> a, glorious a glorious mess. mess. It's wonderful because you're getting all sorts of sales <laughs> and you're seeing money come in, yes. but you're starting to feel like it's getting out of control and you can't keep up with it. That is the moment. That is the time when you say, I need to get help. I need to start creating these systems. I can't do this on my own. So first the sales, first the money, then start to clean the mess up. Otherwise, you're cleaning up a mess that might not even really be worth anything. <laughs> Does that answer your question? That is exactly it. Yeah, no, that is exactly it. And I think... A lot of times people invest in creating processes, courses, they invest in even creating products that no one wants yeah. or writing books that no one wants or creating courses that no one wants. And I'm just thinking, sell it first, make the mess, get the sales, and then we'll figure it all out afterwards. Yes, yes. I love the idea of the glorious mess. It sounds disturbing and disgusting, but I love it. <laughs> well, and that's what entrepreneurs really, great entrepreneurs do. They sell, they make a mess, and then they clean it up. Now, the one thing that I would say with it is, the other caution I would have, though, is sometimes entrepreneurs, there's the honeymoon phase. You start to have success, and you start to feel that, and you go, well, I'm making enough money now. I'm going to be able to figure this out. I know how to do this. And they usually don't start reaching out for help in terms of coaching or consulting until about three to six years down the road. And I believe that's too far. You do not have to experience ridiculous amounts of pain to start getting help. In fact, I'll be interested to see what you think of this, Alan. I believe that a low threshold for pain is a characteristic of successful entrepreneurs, meaning Ooh. you can't tolerate things not being right. You can't tolerate the pain of it. Because think about it. If someone can put up with large amounts of pain, what do they do? They just keep muddling on with things being horrible for a long period of time. But if someone goes, wow, you know, if they're, you get a little wimpier about it and you're like, wow, that, that doesn't feel good. I got to fix that. Then you start to solve problems a lot faster. So at least that's my take on it. No, I think that's really interesting. I, th I think there's actually two sides to this, which you've got to be careful because if you've got a low tolerance for pain, that sometimes is the perfectionists mm. and then they want everything to be right before they start because they're worried about it. And then on the other side, you've got the people who have a high tolerance to pain. Even if the customer is shouting at them, they don't care. They're not going to stay in business very long. And there's probably somewhere in the middle... Yeah. I think that the, the perfectionist, they want to avoid all pain together before they even experience it. Yes. They don't want to fail. Yeah. What I'm saying is you, you create it and then you fix it as soon as you feel it. So it's, I think it's a subtle distinction. And I believe in being an improvementist, not a perfectionist, meaning there's never going to be a perfect situation. There is always going to be a, a place to improve. And so our goal is to make the systems better there's no such thing as a perfect system. There's only the next draft. Yes, definitely. Definitely. And one of the things I keep repeating to people is you cannot get to version two without having done version one. So launch the thing. <laughs> Let's see what happens. Then we can get it better. And you can't get to version two without going through version one. Well, I think that's why we're getting along so well. A, a, a sign <laughs> of an intelligent person is someone whose opinions agree with yours. <laughs> I'm not sure that's true. Uh, <laughs> Oh, and actually, 
I don't know. You said you listened to a couple of episodes of the podcast before coming on, which I'm very grateful of. Uh, there's a very cheesy introduction at the start of season one, which has a, an American voice. And then it comes on with my voice saying, uh, if we're not having fun, you know, we're not doing this. And uh, the feedback from season one stung a little bit, but I got quite a lot of abuse for how cheesy my introduction was. <laughs> But I at least got series one of the podcast out there. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And every year gets better, right? Yeah. There will be a new one for season two. So your show, Dave, will be introduced with the new one. So if you're listening to this, you will have heard the new introduction to the show. Please feel free to go back and listen to the one in season one and write me an email telling me whether you think it's better or not and whether I've improved from version one or not. <laughs> I'm kind of hoping I will. I'm working on it at the moment. Yeah. Cool. So love the concept of the glorious mess and making the glorious mess, getting the first sales, getting the money and asking for help and support earlier. So let's have a look at a sliding scale here from I'm a year in and I've made a few dollars, a few pounds to I'm four years in and I'm making decent money. Like, what types of support do you get when and where does this support come from? Well, part of it is just starting to keep a running track. I say running. I don't I don't really think you should do it all the time, but maybe, you know, once every six months, just take an inventory of everything that you're doing and just make that list out. And, and this may be a little bit more of a detailed list than what I was talking about when you're budgeting your time, right? You're just listing out, oh, I'm editing. I'm writing content for social media. I'm responding to things on social media. I'm doing my accounting. You know, you just, you just list that out. And then maybe, you know, every once in a while you look at it and say, which of these things could I hand off to someone or something else? And by something, I mean like software, like an app or something like that. And then you don't try and get rid of it all, but just one little thing at a time. Just hand off like the, the editing of your podcast. And what that does is it means you're spending a little less time in something that isn't as valuable and a little bit more time in something that is. Uh, one thing I like to say a lot is whenever you say yes to one thing, you're saying no to something else. The opposite is also true. Whenever you say no to something, you're saying yes to something else. If I say no to uh, doing my bookkeeping, then I'm saying yes to a little bit more time doing sales. So we can make little incremental improvements over time and they really start to add up. A 2% increase in productivity is an entire work week every single year. When I say that number, it sounds wrong, doesn't it? Like how can that be possible? But if you do the math, we got 52 weeks, 2%, one week, right? And my whole career has been built around little 2% increases stacked upon each other. Improving my computer, improving my chair, delegating something to someone else, outsourcing a part of what I do to something else, and gradually doing that as my income for my business and sales have grown. And the more it grows, I always allocate a little more time, a little more attention to getting rid of one more thing. And, you know, I, I was teaching this one time and I thought, gosh, if a 2% increase equals one work week and I've done this hundreds of times, have I gained years in my career? And the answer is yes. I mean, I've written five business books. I've created 35 courses. I even wrote uh, in my spare time, I wrote a young adult science fiction novel and <laughs> I work a shockingly no low number of hours per week. You would probably think me uh, feckless and lazy if you knew the number. And yet I'm making more money than I made before. And all of this is because of this philosophy just repeatedly stacked upon itself. I love that idea of a 2% increase. Dave, I feel like I want to ask you, you know, how many hours do you work a week? <laughs> is that something you're willing to share? Well, what I'll say is that has evolved over time. <laughs> <laughs> because the risk of me saying that, especially to new entrepreneurs, is they're going to say, that's where I want to be. And they start to do it immediately. And you got you to gotta earn it. This is the Tim Ferriss four-hour work week principle yeah. of, yes, you can get to running a business with a low number of hours, but you don't start there. 
you could have put in a huge amount of work to design the engine, build the business and do the thing. Exactly. And that comes later. But right now it would be less than 20. So that's a fantastic work-life balance as that it were. That would be accurate. And, and let me give you a different perspective too because there was a, a business owner that I worked with. When I first started working with her, she had daycares and music schools, dance studio, that kind of thing. And she was working 60 hours a week, had about 100 employees, was just completely buried. She wanted to have another child and couldn't do it. And she was just flailing out of control and she hired me and then she almost quit at the last moment. I'm like, you just got to stay the course. Angie, you got to do this. And I say her name because she's given me permission to tell her story. Her name's Angie Ford. And she hung in there and she went from 60 to 40 within a year. And then she went from 40 to 20 within a couple of years after that. And by the time I was done with her, she went to two. And that's because she had gotten the business to the point where she could hire someone else to run the business. And at that point also, not only did she get down to two, but she had two more locations and she had more than double the employees that she had when she started. So the philosophy isn't just for me. It isn't just for an author or a speaker. It can be for any entrepreneur listening to it. But it starts with the little things that we've been talking about, like turning off email notifications. That is the first step. And scheduling time when you check your email. These are the things that start that process to buy you some time so that in the future you can get to that end result. I love that. So we've got turning off notifications. We've got scheduling your time and working out your most valuable activity. Can you give me two or three other examples of 2% changes that entrepreneurs can implement this week to start making progress? Yeah. One thing that I would talk about is having discussions or setting expectations with customers Figuring out how you're communicating with them. Now, that this is typically going to be more in a B2B setting, but establishing the norms for channels of communication, meaning when they call you, how long should it be until they expect a return call? If you have voicemail, even managing the voicemail expectation. Most people, if you call their voicemail, it says, leave a message and I'll get back to you when? As soon as possible. What does that mean? <laughs> it doesn't mean anything. And so what happens is people start hitting you up constantly. Well, you didn't call me back in five minutes. I said as soon as possible. Five minutes isn't as soon as possible. So you got to say, I check my messages at noon and at four or whatever it is. And managing the expectations of other people will go a long tw way toward reducing switches. Another thing, uh, we've talked more about kind of the, the uh, external or what I call passive switches, but there are also the active switches. They're the ones that you're doing to yourself. For example... I guarantee someone listening to this podcast, this discussion has had an idea come into their head. It might not even been related to what we're talking about, right? They got their next idea to make, you know, their next $10,000 or whatever it is. And they got excited about it. My question is, what did you do with that idea? Did you write it down? Did you put it into a place where you know that you're going to review that note later and then decide what action you're going to take on it? A lot of entrepreneurs have a problem with getting these ideas in their head and letting them float in their head. And then what happens with that is your brain is not built to handle unresolved tasks. So it will remind you at the worst possible moments. You'll be on a date with your spouse and you go, oh, that's right. There was that million dollar idea. And you'll be nodding your head, like pretending to pay attention. And in the back of your mind, you're building it out, right? Or you'll be in the middle of meeting with a customer and you'll think, oh my gosh, I should have picked up the laundry. Yep. <laughs> all of these are still switches and all of these, you're still paying a cost on it. So you have to build a system of when you're going to process through all these ideas. It happens to me all the time when I'm doing something. It's happened when I'm out with my wife and we're having a conversation and something pops into my head. I should have done that. And I've got used to now actually saying to her, just hold on one second, let me write down something. <laughs> and I pull out my phone, write it in my yeah. notebook, close it and go, really sorry about that. Uh, <laughs> and then we get back on with the conversation. But I do think you're right. And the way I see it is there's lots of ideas floating around in my head. And if I can just grab them and write them down, I can do something about them. If I allow them to float around up there, eventually they'll float off to someone else. And I don't really want that to happen. Mm. I like my ideas. I like doing something about them. 
Yeah. One thing that I advocate, especially for entrepreneurs, is what I call the perhaps list. So you gather these ideas and you have a time in your week that you look at them. And then at that point, you're asking yourself the question, do I want to do something about this right now? And for some of them, you'll go, yeah. And when you decide that, you schedule time in your calendar to do it. But for some of them, you'll go, I don't know, maybe, probably not. I don't know. You put those on a perhaps list. And then maybe once per month, you take 30 minutes and you just scan through the perhaps list and say, am I going to pick anything up? And there's no, you don't have to pick something up. But I have put many very great business ideas on the perhaps list that I will never execute. Yet it still feels me it makes me feel okay because I know that I respected the value of that idea. In fact, I, you want me to give you one of them? Because anyone can steal this if they're listening to the podcast. <laughs> Do it. Give it away. This is my favorite one on my perhaps list. It's brilliant. Okay. We like Benny Hannes, right? What's Benny Hannes? What's Benny yeah. Hannes? You what go, is Benny Hannes? Do you, you have that in the UK? It's a, a tempanyaki, right? Where the, they're oh, cooking cool. the food, the Japanese food in front of you, all that kind of stuff, right? That's an established business model. Well, I've spent a little time in Japan. And one thing I know is they get a kick out of American culture. So what if we did a reverse Benihana's? Ooh. What if you set up a restaurant in Tokyo and you had guys dressed up like cowboys and you're like, you're out in the middle of the dark and they're telling dumb jokes, cowboy <laughs> jokes, and they're wearing their, <laughs> their gear while they're cooking steaks on the grill for you. That's like a billion dollar <laughs> idea right there. I'm telling you. I can almost see the English version now with someone dressed up, making you tea in front of you, maybe cutting the crusts <laughs> off your sandwich and serving them to you and then talking Wait, about the weather to you. They do that actually yeah. here. They do. Yeah, they do high tea at a, at a <laughs> hotel here. It's quite popular. But that's, that's an idea. It's not an opportunity. And there's a difference between the two and entrepreneurs have to learn how to separate yes. it. So the perhaps list is a great place to put those ideas until you decide whether or not they're truly an Which then that brings us back to focus. Because if you put most of your stuff on the perhaps list, you can actually focus on the one thing you want to make progress on, which I think is so critical. Yes. Typically, I only pick up perhaps list ideas that are directly related to what it is that I do that sells the most. Everything else is just kind of a flight of fancy that really doesn't need my attention. So our time is sort of coming to a close, Dave. But I had one last question for you, which is, imagine I've got a new project, a new business I want to launch, a new thing I'm doing. How do I start about getting organized and making it happen? Like, what are the practical steps? Like, I want to run a Kickstarter. I want to launch this business. I want to do a mini experiment in mm. this. How would you go about doing that in the most efficient way and getting started? I like using the divide and conquer method. So what that means is I say, where do I want to be one year from now? And probably not much more than that. I think once entrepreneurs start thinking two, three, four, five years, they start to get a little yes, insane. Definitely. <laughs> with their dreams. So I say one year from now, where should this be? And then I cut it in half and I say, okay, well, what do I need to be six months from now? to make that progress. And then I cut that in half. I said, where do I need to be three months from now? And then maybe I cut it down to a month and I keep cutting it down until I say, what do I need to do mm. this week? And I map out all those things on the calendar. So at the six month mark, I'm here, three month mark, I'm here. And then it comes down to me finally scheduling one task. And that one task should be stupid simple. It should be open up Microsoft Word or whatever it is, just one little thing. And this does a few different things. First of all, it helps you plan and get kind of a general idea without getting too bogged down in the details. And it also helps you fight procrastination by focusing on just a small thing. Part of the reason why people procrastinate is they look at a task and they go, oh my gosh, I've got to do 50 different things to make that happen. <laughs> and they yep. burn out. And entrepreneurs are really good at that because you're great at ideation, right? Most of the people following you have really vivid imaginations and those vivid imaginations are great for businesses. They're not great for task completion. It gets in the way of task completion. So, so I've had to learn and I teach clients to break things down into the first minute of activity. What's the first minute? Well, the first minute is I need to look at that article I was looking at before. Okay. Schedule that in your calendar. Maybe you schedule a half hour for it. Cause you know, once you do that, it's going to be easier to go into the next step, whatever that is. 
But start big, break it down, break it down, break it down until you get down to just one minute. And then do it. (laughs) Just do it. (laughs) Well, yes. But I find that if you schedule it on the calendar and it's only one minute, it's pretty hard for people not to do it. And that's kind of the perspective I come from. And one thing we didn't mention, I, you know, I was diagnosed as off the charts ADHD. So when I come from the perspective with time management, working with entrepreneurs, I'm coming from the perspective of someone who gets how incredibly easy it is to be distracted and not follow through. So what I'm trying to do is make it so easy for anyone to do, because that's what's required for me to do it. I love that. I love that because the version I normally say is, can you do 15 minutes of it? And my wife actually says that to me when I'm procrastinating on a task. She says, Alan, can you just do 15 minutes? And I kind of drop my head and go, yes. Mm. (laughs) And then I start, I do 15 (laughs) minutes and I go, this is actually quite fun. Why was I scared? And I end up doing two hours and completing it and feeling amazing afterwards. But I need that permission just to do 15 minutes to get started. Yeah. So one way that I like to do is sometimes when people think of doing a project, they're excited about it. And then when they do the project, they're excited about it. It's the moment just before that's what we need to turn off. We need to turn off the feeling that we have just before we do something because it doesn't serve us. It gets in the way of it. So focus on how you imagine you're going to feel and then focus how you felt afterward. And that also will help you move past procrastination. I love that, Dave. So. Thank you so much for your time, your tips, your energy. It's been great chatting to you. To the audience, please take the ideas that Dave has said about removing the distractions, focusing on the MVA, the most valuable activity, working out where you're spending your time, the 2% improvements. There was a huge amount of value in this podcast that you can take away and use. And Dave, if, if the audience wants to find out more about you, where do they go? And is the book on Amazon or do we find it in bookstores? Well, we can't go to bookstores at the moment, but you know what I mean. Where do they find yeah. more about you? Yeah. Well, to get to the book directly on Amazon, you go to multitaskbook.com and that'll take you right there, at least uh, Amazon United States. And then if you want to follow me, I'm always putting out free resources, tips, that kind of stuff. You can follow me at davecrenshaw.com. Crenshaw is C-R-E-N-S-H-A-W. Awesome. Dave, that's fantastic. And please go and check out Dave's tips. Any last words for our entrepreneurs listening? You know, just one thing that we didn't cover. I mentioned that there were three effects of multitasking. Things take longer, they make more mistakes, and you increase your stress levels. Be aware of the fourth effect, which is when you multitask on a human being, you damage the relationship. You're communicating that they're less important than whatever it is you're doing. The beautiful thing, though, is if you start to become someone who focuses on others, focus on your customers, focus on your family, focus on the people that you work with, you stand out because it is now becoming relatively uncommon to give people your full attention. And if you're someone who gives other human beings your full attention, you stand out in a world that's addicted to the myth of multitasking. I love that. It's unbelievably true. If you don't believe, Dave, go to your local cafe, go to your local restaurant and look how many people have their phones out whilst they're chatting to the people around them. Mm -hmm. And you will see that at work. You are so right, Dave. And that power of focus to the individuals you're with is unbelievable. Unbelievable. Thank you so much. And thank you for coming on the show. Thank you, Alan. Been a lot of fun. It's not often I ask for help, but today I could do with some of your help if you wouldn't mind. The Rebel Business School has launched in Colombia. They ran their first course before Christmas, helping people to build businesses without debt. There is an incredible team out there, Alfredo, Fabi and Danny, who are building the business there. And we are working with them to help them find sponsors who are interested in running courses and helping people become more entrepreneurial in Colombia. What we wondered is do you know anyone who has a business in Colombia? Do you know anyone who is connected in Colombia? Do you know anyone who works for one of the big organizations that trades between the United States or United Kingdom and Colombia? If you do, it would really help us because we're looking to increase our network 
and meet the right people that will help us to change the way entrepreneurship is taught in Colombia and help more people to build businesses doing what they love. So if you could have a think, see if there's someone you could share it with, see if there's someone that you could tell about it. Maybe you could just tell them there's this cool new thing starting in Colombia. It's all about helping people build businesses and they're looking to talk to people with connections there. Maybe you could just start that and see who we could talk to. Me, Fabi, Alfredo and Danny would be eternally grateful for any connections you might have that would help us to bring the Rebel Business School to Colombia. Thank you for listening to the show. Thank you for being part of it. Good luck with your business. Go make it happen. You can have any life you want to. Choose to build something cool. Choose to take action. Choose to work to make your dreams become reality. Stand out. Be different. Be yourself. Be a rebel entrepreneur.